You're listening to Inclusive AF with Jackie Clayton and Katie Van Horn. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Katie Van Horn. And this is Jackie Clayton. Whoop, whoop. And I'm this is trying to make that exciting. Well, it is an exciting day. Uh, this is the Inclusive AF Podcast. And Jackie, do you want to share your very exciting news? Um, I'm a homeowner. Woohoo! <laughs> what? <laughs> Number one, I don't even know why they would let someone who's like almost 50 sign a 30-year release. That doesn't seem like a winning proposition, <laughs> but I'm down. What am I going to do? <laughs> why argue? Jackie, it's a 30-year mortgage, not lease. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, right, right. right. <laughs> now I'm really screwed. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So very exciting day today. Uh, uh, Jackie got her case yesterday, so that's awesome. Um, and we have an amazing guest today. Um, we can call her Jackie's boss, but yeah, I, I don't even know like, like that first is our, our lead in. I, I let's, think yeah, let's start with this question. What do you think about your VP of yeah, I, A I, and DEI? If you could just tell the people. Jackie's we're going to do Jackie's performance review on right this now. podcast. On this wow. That's amazing. Okay. Actually, we're due for it. So, right. <laughs> And it'll it'll go with the theme of what we're talking about. So it's going to work out perfectly. So Kieran, would love for you to introduce yourself and say uh, and whatever you'd like to share. <laughs> sure. My name is Kieran Snyder. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Textio. I am Jackie's boss. I was so excited when she joined <laughs> almost a year ago now, Jackie. I know. You're coming you up in that, that one year. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I live in Seattle. I have three girls in middle school, so life is not too boring right now. And little known fact, Jackie knows this fact, but maybe Katie doesn't know this fact. Maybe you do. Um, my co-founder is also my spouse. So we founded Textio together. I know. Amazing. <laughs> and, and we, we still like each other. <laughs> and we still like each other, like quite a bit. So it works out. <laughs> That's awesome. That's perfect. Um, so yeah, so you're in Seattle. I'm in Arizona, but I feel like I'm in Seattle right now because it's been rainy for like the last week with monsoons. So uh, we got woken up last night at like 1.30 in the morning with thunder and lightning. And I'm like, no, it's Arizona. We need to <laughs> ease up on that. I don't do humidity. Ari Arizona has this whole magazine called Arizona Sunsets. Do you know it? I do. Yes. <laughs> don't ask why I know that. That'll be a different podcast. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, yes, absolutely. And, and we do have some great, some great sunsets here. So it works out perfectly. Um, so Kieran, we would love to start off, uh, you know, you kind of just shared a little bit about, you know, your spouse being your, your co-founder, but would love to hear the origin story of Textio and, and kind of what prompted you to start Textio. Yeah. Okay. How deep into my psyche do we want to go here? I'll go, I'll go like, I'll go, medi I'll go medium deep. You can direct me shallower. Yeah. Um, basically, my whole life has been about language and math, like forever. So my dad, who is in his 80s, is still running his small electrical engineering company. I think he will do it until he can no longer do it. Um, so he was an engineer and my mother was a writer. And so I grew up to be an engineer and a writer, like very much the two and uh, studied linguistics and math in college. And then I got my PhD in natural language processing and um, never intended to work in technology. I swear this will get to text you, but I, I never intended to work in technology. Um, but when I finished my PhD, I realized for the first time in my life, I didn't want an academic job. And I, that's all I thought I ever wanted. I, and I got some, some job offers and I turned them down, which you do not do in academia. And I spent a year writing and totally running out of money. So I am a year out of my PhD. I am broke. I need a job. And I had a friend who was at Microsoft at the time who said, you should come work here. We're hiring people like you. And I was like, no, hate all those people. Not interested in working in technology. Like I'd been coding since I was a little kid. And he was like, but you said you needed a job. And I was like, that is true. So I took the job and I thought I would be there for one year, but it turns out I fell in love with software, like really fell in love with software. And um, 
got to do some amazing things when I was at Microsoft and I felt really inspired by the impact I got to have, you know, in academia, I wrote a dissertation, maybe 200 people read it. I felt a little bit like I was in an ivory tower. Um, and then I went to this world where a billion people used what I made. And so I, I got really inspired and motivated by that. And I was there for about nine years. So I, I stayed much longer than the one I intended. And then I got to the end of that time and I felt like this super familiar feeling like I had when I was leaving academia, like, you know, they offered me a pretty good job for what my next job was going to be. And I was like, I don't want it. Like, I don't want it. Um, I don't know why. I don't know what I want to do. It was just like when I left academia. Um, and at that time um, where my whole career had been on the language side of the house, you know, I worked in search for a really long time, um, always in machine learning, natural language processing. Jensen, who is the other founder of Textio, had been building this career around user experience. You know, three times he led the design and implementation of billion person user experiences, right? He invented with our VP of UX, he invented the first UI for email ever, which became Outlook and then the Office Ribbon and, and Windows Surface UI. And so we were really talking about the future of writing and writing software and trying to figure something out in that space. And as that was happening, I was super bored in my end days corporate job. And I was publishing quite a bit about language and bias. Um, and I had a little piece on performance feedback that went viral in Fortune um, and then wrote a bunch of other pieces related to resumes and job descriptions and why women were leaving the technology industry. And then we put all the pieces together um, and it really became Textio. So, you know, a lot of the intent behind the company was to take this power in language and data and use it to help people say what they really intended to say. Um, with all of what Jensen brought around making a user experience that you didn't need to be a data scientist to use, mm -hmm. but just regular everyday people could use and feel really powerful. So that's my origin story and a little bit of Textio's. Awesome. Superhero, cool. super villain, you decide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, superhero for sure. So I, I think back to the first time I was exposed to Textio and just the like, holy crap, this is so cool that we're actually able to look at language in a very different way and determine what is going to get more eyes on it, more people engaged in a job posting, more people that we hadn't seen before and how great that was. And, and I think that's, you know, obviously that's the whole concept, but even, you know, looking at different countries. And so, you know, once I was on my own doing consulting, I had a few clients that used Textio and seeing how that played out across the world also was so neat to kind of see those language differentiators, you know, in Germany versus in the U S or wherever. So it was just really, really neat. So uh, I'm obviously a, a huge fan. Um, I think Jackie might be as well. A um, little bit, a little bit. I even like, it was funny when I woke up this morning, I was like, why was this a good idea? Like we're having my boss on the podcast. <laughs> I love your Ooh, podcast. How so. did this do? <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Um, and then I was just kind of like, you know, I'm sharing my boss with the world, you know, but I'm so grateful always have been a fan in fact i've known karen for a number of years i look back at, it makes me laugh now it was on um i forget the website but karen was doing an ask me anything it was product hunt product hunt mm -hmm. yeah and i had it's still there from 2000 like from like seven years ago and it's like is this going to help with diversity and inclusion it's me asking karen and now it's like hilarious to think like well, yeah, duh. And me being like, oh, so I'm so cool. Watch this. Ask me anything. Okay. Here's a question. <laughs> Batty, try to do that. Um, and coming full circle. But I think what's interesting about Karen's story too, which I always crack up about is that is having the understanding of your background and knowing it's doing it for good, but then also being part of these massive things like I, I do, I love my job, but I sit in awe of them knowing the knowledge that they bring to the table. And, and I remember saying to Kieran, oh my gosh, you work on spell check. Like, I'm just like, my eyes are this big. And Kieran's like, what? People can't spell. 
I was like, oh yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they still can't. They yeah, still probably can't. made it worse with spell check. What Jackie doesn't know is I, I felt okay. That peeling back the curtain a little. Like, <laughs> so Jackie, when she asked me that question, doesn't know I was already a fan of hers and mm-hmm. tracking all of the writing she was doing. Uh, I don't remember if you were at Recruiting Daily yet at that time, but it was like pretty similar time frame. Um, and I've been like on the down low watching Jackie's content for years. And last summer, about 13 months ago now, when <laughs> I knew we were going to be hiring for this role, I was like, would she consider it? Wouldn't she consider it? I was like that shy kid, like, do I make the call? And I, um, I cold sourced Jackie Clayton. And she was like, by the way, showing I have some TA chops, I cold sourced Jackie Clayton. And she was like, actually, yes, let's talk. And I was like, I said to one of Jackie's peers who leads our HR function, I was like, she answered, she answered. (laughs) We're in, this is happening. (laughs) <laughs> I felt so excited when Jackie joined us because at Textio specifically, having somebody who sits at the intersection of talent and DEI, mm-hmm. who I think is one of the best people in the country doing this work, leading our internal systems and processes is the way we stay aligned with our product, our messaging, and our internals at the same time. So like, it's a, a beautiful friendship. And now yes. we're here. <laughs> and and I'll tell you on the other end of that, Karen, when you did reach out to her, she, I, I think, immediately reached out to me and a few of our other friends like, oh, my God, Karen Schneider. <laughs> 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 so what do yeah, I do? Though? We're holding ourselves up like, <laughs> holy like, moly, well, it's gone back. <laughs> I love that. Well, that means like Katie and uh, our, our VP of, of HR, Sandy, should hang out. They probably have good stories. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So recently you published some new research and and I want to dig in on that because I think, you know, as we are talking about diversity and kind of some of these topics that we know have been talked about, you know, as you mentioned, kind of the article, that it was like 2013, 2014 that you published around, you know, reviews and, and how reviews are done and the gender bias that shows up and some of these other things that we're now unpacking around it. I think the part that I love about the research that you've done is that it digs in further than just gender, which Mm -hmm. I think is, you know, kind of a, another layer of the onion, if you will, that has not, people haven't dug into yet. And so would love to have you just share, kind of tell us a little bit about the research, how, you know, what you found, what were some, what were some ah ahas for you? Yeah. So, um, this was so much more comprehensive than what I did in 2014. Um, and of course, we had the whole power of Textio's team collaborating on this one. 2014, I was toiling in isolation, and that was not the case this time. Um, so in 2014, the original study included hundreds of people and analysis of their performance reviews. This was more than 25,000 people. Um, who worked across 253 different organizations. And so the patterns that show up are really patterns. Like they're really, really robust. Um, And a couple of the organizations that um, kind of formally participated that are existing Texio partners gave quite a bit of data. So we were able to actually see inside a couple of intact larger organizations, whether the same trends applied. So like a couple of really... um, not surprising and then surprising things. Um, so surprise, bias is real, no surprise, haha. Um, <laughs> right, as we as we look into it, um, when you see that, uh, you know, compared to wet men, women are seven times more likely to be described as opinionated or 11 times more likely to be described as abrasive. That was pretty consistent with what I had found previously. Um, But as you say, when you layer in other dimensions like race and age, um, you find just vast differences like uh, Black and Latinx people report being described as passionate more than twice as often. Well, is that always a good thing in the workplace setting? It's actually often a euphemism for like, okay, you're you're talking too much. Um, 
right? And so you see things like that show up where the black men receive a third less feedback than white women uh, on average, or that black women receive nearly nine times as much feedback that isn't actionable, you know, compared to white men uh, under 40, especially. So you start seeing these patterns. And I think the thing that was um, most surprising to me, and in like kind of a sad way, was how much is not different than in 2014. Because in between now and then, a lot of stuff has happened in the world, right? Like the rise of the Me Too movement, the spotlight on the Black Lives Matter movement, like you have more people, I think, taking this more seriously, at least at a theoretical level, like you have more people who have more awareness than they had before. And yet, it's not showing up in the patterns, because they're so deep. Um, you know, they're not conscious most of the time. Um, and so it's, it's really, really striking. Um, so I don't know, there's a, it's a whirlwind tour, there's a lot we could dive into there. But um, not much has changed in the last decade. Yeah, I think that's the 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 aha. Just when I was going through it, it was like this is the same report that. So we were part of the Claim Institute work that was done uh, in 2015, and you know, and, and it's the same messages around gender, and you know, the ambitious versus aggressive, and some of these things that came up. And I, but I do want to ask a question, and uh, you know, kind of leading the witness here a little bit. So you mentioned that, you know, black men don't get feedback. Why is that a problem? Well, it's really interesting when you look at quality of feedback by demographic group over long periods of time, there is a direct correlation with pay. So the people who get the groups of people really who get the highest quality and highest volume of feedback tend to also be the people who get paid the most. And you could argue like chicken and egg here, but I think a lot of talent management practitioners have kind of maintained for years that there is a relationship between quality of feedback and growth. And of course there is. If you're not getting constructive feedback regularly, you're at a disadvantage. And it turns out that disadvantage magnifies over time into homogenous leadership teams, pay disparities. And so one of the reasons I'm so excited about the language side of it is it's a chance to get upstream of the outcomes. You know, if you can help interrupt that bias when it's subtle and early and it's about, you know, whether somebody is described as a go-getter or not, then you have a chance to preempt the real disparities that have such socioeconomic problems associated with them later. It's a leading indicator, right? And how many leading indicators like this do we get that we can really disrupt early? That's why I'm so excited about language as a space because uh, you really can make outcomes more equitable over time. I yeah, think, I think it's, when you look at it, one thing, other thing that was really interesting is that a lot of people picked up on it and wanted to share what we had found, but picked a different quote for the headline I just found that fascinating. Like Fortune's headline is different than Essence Magazine's headline, like all of the different ones that people picked up on, which just spoke, said that it's, it just spoke to everyone in a little bit of a different way. And that's the whole point. Like what stands out in this language? Um, people read and, and take those things in a different way. And it's so important because we talk about, people talk about unconscious bias, um, but they're only dealing with the conscious bias, like in the day to day, like, oh, I need to make sure I don't talk down to this person or whatever. It's like, no, that's fully conscious. When you're writing your 16th review and it's 10 o'clock on a Friday night, you really, really want to do good. But I always say it looks like the back of a yearbook where it's like, oh, stay cool. Have a nice summer. You're awesome. Like, you know, you want to say the things. Um, but you're, you're, you can be tired and overwhelmed with all of the feedback that you're giving. And this is like so helpful in that. Um, Cause I think in my experience, at least a lot of the feedback is like that where it's really unconscious. You're really trying to tell them they're doing a good job. Um, and so I think it's interesting to start in digging into performance management um, 
because it really does tap into that unconscious part. Like I didn't realize this was negative or yeah, I guess it's not actionable versus um, some other types of feedback. That you see. Yeah. You know, and I think like one of the things that was most striking to me is that even when people are giving what they believe to be positive feedback, like these are, you know, uh, employees that their managers are trying to celebrate, the kinds of positive feedback that show up itself has bias in it. When people are writing their, you know, 16th review and they're fatigued and they're like, you know, I'm just going to give the positives now. Even that has discrepancies, right? So when you see that Asian men are described as brilliant or geniuses more than six and a half times more often than Black or Latinx women, um, it's not to say that managers don't believe that they're giving uh, Black and Latinx women positive feedback. They're calling them overachievers, right? Like that's comparable to being a genius. It actually is like, the, the weirdest backhanded compliment. It's like, you did a good job, even though my expectations were pretty low. <laughs> like, you know, and so I like, even in the places where managers think they're being positive, there are disparities. Um, and of course, both of those are terrible kinds of feedback to give because they're not actually constructive or actionable in any way, right? Um, so I, that's, uh, that's the thing that's interesting. I um, and you're right, there is a little something for everyone in it. Like everybody who covered the piece pulled out insights that were most interesting to kind of their area of study or their demographic because the discrepancies are all over the data. Yeah, to, to, to that point, and I think, you know, the, the piece that always came up and Jackie, you mentioned it kind of, and it's the, how many times I heard from managers like, oh, I copied and pasted on every review because it's a 16 page review or, you know, it's, and we've all seen those reviews that you're like, who wrote this and thought it was a good idea to have like a 10 page review that a manager had to fill out because no one's doing that. And so, you know, how do you actually think about the review process differently completely to actually make sure it is actionable feedback, all of these things. And the other one that it's the, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. And then back to your point on the compensation. Okay. Well, if I'm doing such a great job and I should keep doing what I'm doing, where's the money? Where is that promotion? Where is that comp? All those things. But the other piece that I would say, and I, I love that you put this in here is, you know, a couple of things about just examples of what is good feedback? What's exaggerated feedback? How do you have, have actionable feedback? Like give people examples and concrete ways to think about this differently. Cause I think that's the other piece that it's, it might not be a there it's, it is unconscious. So there isn't a, Oh, I'm going to try and write this vaguely or not give people, you know, what they need, but giving an example of, you know, what is actionable and not actionable. So people can use that and actually write it in the right way in the future. That's how, how we start to see change as well, which is fantastic. So I love that part. He just went totally on mute. Boom. Done. Done. I'm done talking now. No, I'm just <laughs> it's like mic drop. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Boom. Done. Yeah. Out of here. <laughs> well, I, I'm just, I like, I keep going because I've already read it, but I like keep going back and I just, this is such good information and such, uh, it, it's such good content and it's stuff that everyone should be reading this. And so, you know, whatever we can highlight, whatever we can do to, to bring this across every leader's desk to say, even just if you skim through and get the highlights, there's some really critical stuff that you need to know. Um, so what's next research wise? What are you working on now? Um, I don't think we're done with this. I okay. mean, I think, I don't think we're done with this. Like, I think we've honestly just scratched the surface. One of the things I'm most interested in is seeing how many of these, like there are some patterns that transcend particular organizations. That's true. There are some patterns that are just culturally deeper, but we also know on the recruiting side from everything we've done that organizations do have distinct communication cultures mm -hmm. as well. And so starting to understand with organizations what's going on inside. And, you know, when you're talking about an intact organization, there are clear people who are accountable to changing the reality. When you talk about like broad society, like, are we all accountable? Is no one accountable? But like in an organization, it's someone's job. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really interested in 
seeing what's happening in organizations. So simple example um, that shows up in the data, one of the areas where there's wide disparity from uh, company to company is just volume of written feedback. No surprise, like some teams have a norm of writing a lot and some don't. So in some cases, you'll see employees have an average of 300 words of feedback. And in some cases, you'll see 2000 words of feedback. And that seems kind of like an innocuous distinction. But the more people write, um, the more opportunity there is to observe these differences. Doesn't mean the differences aren't there in the cultures that are writing less, it means it's harder to detect. And so when you ask people to get thoughtful and write out their feedback, it's actually gonna be more helpful uh, in terms of addressing inequities because people have the opportunity to get coaching. Like I'm all about the coaching, like part of the premise of Textio software is that it's almost like a private coach for everybody who's writing. So they have a chance to do better before they publish something. And so to me, when I think about the performance feedback space, you know, every manager needs this kind of coaching. How many billions of dollars are spent on trying to train managers to give good feedback every year? Like a lot. And so I'm, I'm really interested in some of these interventions um, that individual organizations can take to see if they can change some of the patterns across their data set. And I think we're so early in that journey there are very few organizations that are thinking about this kind of intervention. And when you see this kind of data, it can help you know as a people or DEI leader, like, okay, here's where I need to focus. Our marketing organization's really struggling. I'm going to spend my time there this year. Or we have a big problem with employees over 40 not being given growth opportunities. I'm going to spend my time there this year. Um, so I think that the next frontier is organizations getting self-critical and really diving into their own data. You're right. I always thought it was weird on when I would give people, when I was coaching organizations on how to like build a new strategy for diversity, you know, from diverse communities as they were looking for people, they would always say, but how do, what am I supposed to say? And I'd always be like, dude, really? Like now, like we just spent, you know, a month finding the, the, where we need to look and the people that we're looking for. And now you don't know how to communicate with them. And I, and that all boils down to it. I think it's nice to have the micro learning where you are instead of, Oh, I'm going to go to this weekend class and then I'm going to go back to work and then look for examples. And then, Oh, I feel like I'm a good person and maybe I forgot. And then, but this is different where it's like, okay, that sentence right there let's work on that to make that sentence better or do this to make this better because, you know, we don't retain. And so I think it's a big difference to have those micro learnings right where you are. So, you know, exactly what we're, what that you might need to enhance or modify to make sure that you're getting your point across, which is different I love than saying micro learnings. I haven't heard that phrase before, but I really love that as kind of the antidote to microaggressions. It's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. We did it exactly at brand it camp last week. Can't wait what? to tell you about brand camp. I can't so wait to great. hear about it. I can't <laughs> wait to hear about it. But I, I like micro learnings. I think it's that it's all about the coaching. And the, the other like concept I think of in this space is a, is um, you're never done. Like learning and development is like a static kind of thing. I think the software tools, the data, the research here is really all about enablement. It's all about setting up the individual to do better, know better, perform better consistently over time. And if it were as simple as like, here's the five words on a sticky note, you can avoid them. Wow, our world would be in much better shape, but it isn't. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that's it. We had a consultant years ago that I work with you, Karen, you might actually be familiar, uh, Dr. Anna Rowley. She did a lot mm -hmm. of stuff with Microsoft and uh, she had a list of words that the leadership were not allowed to use. Empowerment is the one that always sticks with me, uh, that you cannot use the word empowerment, but it, it is things like aggressive and, you know, some of these words that, that are those hot buttons that also on the receiving end, when you see it, you're like, really? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Just doing my yep. job. Um, but yep. I, uh, the other one that kind of popped out and I, maybe it's just because I'm in this category is, you know, Women over 40 receive more than four times the amount of feedback that's not actionable. And I think that's the, like some of these on the age bias piece are also just fascinating to read 
um, because it is it, like the under 40, you're ambitious, over 40, you're responsible and unselfish. Um, <laughs> how that, <Yep>. that- <laughs> you know, the age, okay, I we could have like a whole discussion about age specifically. Yeah. Age is fascinating because it's a place that people who are otherwise DEI minded fully embrace their bias. Mm-hmm. Like when I talk to people who are, especially in technology, who are building startups and organizations, like, you know, I often point out the difference between conscious bias, semi conscious bias, and unconscious bias, right? So, like, unconscious bias is like, we go out drinking every night. Like, okay, cool. You only want people who go out drinking every night. And conscious bias is like, we only want new grads. Like, Mm -hmm. okay, Mm -hmm. right. In the middle, there's this whole space of like, must have a 3.5 GPA to apply. Like, I can tell you there are a lot of things about me that are much more relevant than my college GPA at this point, (laughs) right? Like the, the decades of life and work I've had in between. And, but when I talk to leaders about the age piece in particular, People who would be very concerned about bias in the gender and race space or disability space or sexual orientation space are just sort of cheerfully like, what's wrong with that? Um, (laughs) Of course, young people are more ambitious and older people are more responsible. In fact, a very prominent scholar who read this report came back to me with like, I like all of it except for the age stuff. And I'm like, hmm. (laughs) <laughs> what's your age <laughs> yeah how ages like, of that, you that's not bias those are just facts i'm like really oh, God. <laughs> perfect <He's>, <laughs> like, don't, don't you think younger people are more ambitious and i'm like i don't know i'm a 48 year old woman i'm still pretty ambitious like right right <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, it's good stuff. And and I, I think the idea of like continuing this and building on what you've done, but again, like it is, you know, when Jackie, you mentioned the micro learnings and I think for any people leaders that are listening to this episode, like go out and, and read this yourself and then take pieces of this, whatever you'd like back to your leadership team, especially as we're kind of getting to that end of year point where folks are going to start gearing up for annual review processes and all of these different things that, you know, however we can implement some of this stuff. And it does just take those small um, learnings, those small things to actually make changes. And, you know, we'll make sure that we have the link for the, uh, you know, for this uh, research in the episode notes so people can go out and download it themselves. Um, Cause I think it's just, it's such a huge and amazing body of work. Um, but I I think it goes back to, it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed in a decade and how, like, at what point do we, at what point do we change? At what point do we actually make this better for everyone that's involved in these processes? So, um, Jackie, what else you got, man? Well, just that I think that we are starting to change. And I think what's, we're starting to see people being willing to change where at one point, and we, and we've talked about it before, where at one point people didn't want to know, like literally on purpose was like, I don't, don't give it to me. I don't want to touch it. I don't want to know anything about it to no, I really need to know. Um, and that's always the you know, first admitting that you have a problem is always that piece. This is actually one of the most encouraging changes I've seen um, within organizations over the last, I'd say, one to two years compared to when we started Textio eight years ago. The legal partner who used to have kind of a point of view in general of, I don't tell me because if I know that I'm liable to fix it and I don't want that paper trail there's a huge shift now where I would say a lot of general counsels say, well, I'm going to be liable for it anyway. Mm-hmm. And so it would be way better for me to know now so that I can fix it and we don't have problems. Like it used to be, you know, la, 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 don't tell me. And now it's, can you tell me so that we can do something about it? And I think that's the most encouraging change that I've seen inside businesses is the, the involvement of the legal team feels real different than it did when we first did this work where they're, they're seeking info, not seeking to bury information. Um, and I think that is because of what's happened more broadly in society where companies are being held to account 
regardless of what they knew or didn't know. And so that gives me a lot of hope for the future um, because it's, it's real when you have the full executive suite buying into the work. And that legal partner has been an obstruction sometimes in the past. And that is less true. Fun fact, my sister's an employment lawyer. Um, and my other sister uh, has a master's in mental health counseling, focusing on institutional microaggressions. And so we did not all plan to align in the same sort of <laughs> career, but it's really Thanksgiving weird. Thanksgiving is awesome at their house. <laughs> it's pretty fun. <laughs> Yes, but, it, but it's been interesting, actually, just watching the evolution of the legal side of the conversation. Yeah, I, I wonder, like it is the, you know, holding companies to account, I think is something that definitely has shifted. And I, I do wonder where that goes next. But we actually, we just had a, a guest on a, a couple weeks ago, Erica Hines, and she was talking about some resources she's doing around Black women thriving. And, you know, the fact that for so long, you know, some of these pieces of research, some of these things, it all leads back to how the person has to change. Usually the person in the marginalized or underrepresented groups. And for this, you know, for her, it was, you know, black women in, at work. And I think that's the other piece about this is we're not asking the folks from underrepresented groups to change. It's leaders, companies. How do you change your process? How do you change the way you think about you're, you know, evaluating your employees and talking to your employee, employees and having those feedback conversations differently. It's not, it's the institution needs to change, not the person that's coming into the institution, which I think is also just a shift in, in how we've thought about some of these topics in the past. It's always been conform or die. And, and so that also, I think is just such a positive piece to this type of research. I think so. And I will say that at the level of the manager, one of the, the most surprising thing in my 2014 study to me was that, and that really focused on gender, was that the gender of the manager didn't make a difference in the patterns of bias that they manifested towards their employees. So it was not the case that women in management reviewed women who worked for them with less personality feedback than men in management did, that the patterns looked exactly the same. And so the other element here is that regardless of your background, you're probably carrying some encoded assumptions and biases, even those that may be being perpetuated on you, <laughs> you may be perpetuating them to your own team. And so there's really opportunity for everybody in that position of leadership to do some reflection and get that coaching, even if you wouldn't think you need it. Like looking at this data had caused me at the time to go back and read a whole bunch of reviews that I had written for my employees um, because, I, you know, and I participated in the same kinds of patterns that others in the study did. And so that's the interesting part as well is that even if you're steeped in this work, you're passionate about it, you yourself have been the recipient of bias it doesn't mean you're not perpetuating it to others. And so there's just ongoing opportunity for learning and enablement in the space because we all got decades to unlearn by the time you're my age. So. Yeah. I, I yes, <laughs> a lot to unlearn in this learning. And, and I think that's something I, I've not gone back to actually look at reviews. I would be scared to do that, but you know, it's worthwhile. Yeah, I'm looking at the the feedback that I know I've given in the past, and especially to, you know, like Black women colleagues where I've been like, you know, it, I've done the, hey, you know, maybe just be a little bit more calm in your approach or, hey, you know, approach more quietly or whatever. And, you know, kind of not acknowledging the fact that it's not them that needs to change, but the system that needs to change. And, and it is just, it is, it's good to reflect on these things and, you know, once you know better, do better kind of thing. So um, so what we'd like to do at the end of each episode is just uh, talk a little bit about kind of what information, what piece of the conversation we want to make sure our listeners hear and, and make sure they take with them kind of moving forward in their day after they hear this episode. So um, would love for you to go first and share kind of what one thing do you want to make sure our listeners heard? Um, I think that you are for your best intentions, carrying a bunch of highly encoded 
biases and assumptions about the people that you're working with. And I'm a software girl, so I'm always a believer that software is a scalable way to help people do better. Even if you're not using software, it's sure better to ask for a second opinion than not to. Like, it's sure better to make sure you're getting other perspectives on high value communication because you're probably carrying perpetuating messages that you are not intending to, even in conversation that doesn't feel um, heavy to you. And the more significant the conversation, like a performance review is a pretty significant document in someone's lives, the more important it is that you get your biases checked however you can. So that's my my number one. Awesome. Thank you. Love Jackie. that. Well, number one, my bias is that my boss is cooler than your boss. That's everyone who's listening, the millions okay, of people. Like, that's my I'm bias. Not, I'm not telling Tasha. Don't tell your boss. No, not yours. Tasha, if you're listening, no, you're listening. no not you, Tasha. I don't mean it. Okay, no, no, absolutely not. But I do. And the other part to remember is people don't change who they are. They change where they are. And that's what we've been seeing when you go through this process. That's why it's so important to give feedback, something that they actually can work on to do better. And because I'm supposed to pick one, and so I pick three. The other one is <laughs> you actually, like, people who over, over 40 really are ambitious, you know, really, really are ambitious. Still that's the big takeaway. Yeah. Yes. Speaking, speaking for ourselves, we are all ambitious. We Thank are. you very much. At least three. Yeah, we've my, done My four. dad in his 80s still running That's his right. company. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so my one thing of all of this is, is just kind of the reiteration of words matter. Language matters. Um, and, and I think just the, again, acknowledging, yes, that we all have bias and the language that we use, we need to be extremely thoughtful about. And the fact that language is constantly evolving as well, that, you know, we need to just acknowledge that and also think about how we approach language and the communication that we have with folks is such a critical piece. So um, thank you for being here thank you. Thank you for taking the time. We appreciate it. Um, do you want to finish up Jackie's review after we stop recording or do you want to go ahead and... Uh, <laughs> We're a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're good, but thank you for having me. This was super fun. <laughs> of course. Absolutely. All right. Well, this is Katie Van Horn. And this is Jackie Clayton. Bye. Bye. Bye.